Okay, so, so the pointer could be very effective. Okay, um, so uh, I started this um, presentation with 1990 because that's the year in which uh, GLORAL became the uh, NOAA Coast Watch node for the Great Lakes. And uh, so part of the charge was uh, in becoming a node, Coast Watch node, was to develop uh, research and develop uh, remote sensing and uh, airborne remote sensing products for the Great Lakes, a few users in the Great Lakes. So, um, right okay, but before I start, I'd like to uh, acknowledge a lot of collaborators, um, colleagues, PIs, techs, institutions, um, and uh, agencies with whom I've worked over the years uh, to develop these products uh, and uh, that I'm going to describe. So ideas, equipment, uh, a lot of uh, hard work, and in a lot of cases, funding uh, that they brought to, to bear. So, uh, and especially, uh, I'd like to mention Dave Schwab and uh, Glenn Muir, who are very instrumental in, uh, in the early development of, uh, of Coast Watch at, at GLURL. Oh. There, so, whoops. So, was there remote sensing uh, research going on at GLURL before Coast Watch? Yes, definitely. Uh, this is an example. It's a uh, classified color-coded uh, image of ice types in the ice cover. This is Northern Green Bay from a satellite image. And this is using uh, visible and near-infrared uh, uh, data in the visible region. And it worked quite well, um, actually. And pursuant to that, uh, I teamed up with uh, Monotech uh, Nick Reed at Monotech, who made a fast recording radio, oops, radiometer, uh, and uh, I was able to mount it on a Coast Guard helicopter and got and get reflectance, airborne reflectance measurements of the ice cover. So it could measure uh, irradiance, radiance, and dark current in seconds. And of course, from the air, you can get a large footprint. Uh, the size of a Landsat pixel, 59 by 70, 56 by 79 meters, roughly a football field. But it was also nadir looking. So, um, and, and of course, most satellites, you know, look, have a look angle. They're not all, all nadir looking always. So, so um, oh boy. Um, so I teamed up with uh, Don Deering at uh, NASA Goddard and brought his instrument, the uh, parabola, and, and he up to the Great Lakes for two years. And we made bi-directional reflectance measurements of, uh, uh, of ice cover and uh, in the Landsat bands. And this is to better represent the off nadir uh, reflectance of the satellite. So this instrument, I don't know if you can, yeah, right there, not maybe not. Anyhow, at the end of the boom, could measure just about the whole four pi star radians, and with that data, then we could create a uh, a map of bidirectional reflectance that you see in the uh, uh, on the left or on the right, I should say, and um, uh, and you can see the specular hot spot uh, in the uh, off the ice in that, and this is. This worked out fine. You know, was, we were making progress. The only thing is that in the Great Great Lakes region during the winter time, there's more than a little abundance of cloud cover. And so, you know, using a visible uh, spectrum is really um, it's not the not the way to go. But luckily, in 1991, ERS-1 was launched. European remote sensing satellite, and it had a imaging SAR, synthetic aperture radar, 
C-band HH polarized. So of course it's a day night, all weather sensor. So I shifted gears at that time and actually operationally that's the way to go. And so I teamed up with a colleague at Jet Propulsion Lab uh, and he built, you know, who, who had built a C-band scatterometer that you see up in the upper left. Um, fully polar metric, which means it measured all the four polarizations. Um, and we got it mounted on, able to get it mounted on the uh, Mackinac icebreaker. And during one mission, the captain stopped for us uh, when we came upon a new ice type or variant across Lake Superior. And so we made about 20 measurements and we measured from zero to 60 degrees incident angle every five degrees. So we could use it with any, uh, any SAR satellite, uh, current or future. And we boiled those down to three types that you can see here, rash ice, pancake ice, three major ice types, and open water. And so with that library, um, I applied it to a RaiderSat-1 satellite image, which is also C-band HH polarized, and classified the ice on Lake Superior, and it worked fairly well. The red is brash ice, very problematic to uh, ice breaking and shipping. Uh, and this worked quite well, except for this yellow area. Again, I, I can't. Yeah, that yellow area, um, which was open water. So um, it, again, operationally it's not too good. Um, you can have an uh, open water classified as an ice type and that's because of the effects of wind speed and direction uh, over water. The little capillary waves uh, can make uh, the water look like uh, an, an ice type. But we developed two methods to get around this, one of which is still being used uh, by Nestus, who was running the algorithm operationally. So um, we, we were able to get around that problem. And uh, I might add here that in the new, newest algorithm that Nestus is running, uh, it also has ranges of ice thickness for each ice type major ice type. So for pancake ice, brash ice, for each of the, the major ice types, there's a thickness range that goes along with that. So I figured, well, once we get a map of ice type, uh, and uh, once we have that map, if we could measure the, um, the uh, transmittance uh, of, uh, you know, par transmiss transmittance, uh, for those types, we can make a, a map of, well, at least of the first order of uh, transmittance, lake-wide transmittance. And uh, so we uh, need to use MODIS for the snow cover, uh, which is not a problem, because as you can see in the uh, little graph, snow of any thickness uh, can greatly attenuate uh, transmittance. So um, using modus imagery, then you know, we can uh, derive this map of uh, lake-wide transmittance, which yeah, say to the first order is better than what we had, which is nothing. Uh, so, and it's another image of us uh, uh, measuring the transmittance. And there again, we did this with folks from uh, Bob Shookman, Shookman's group uh, MTRI. So um, about this time, QuickScat was launched, and uh, QuickScat is a, a scatterometer, uh, KU band, and doesn't have quite the spatial resolution as SAR, synthetic aperture radar, but uh, it has a uh, it's it's H and V polarized, and therefore can uh, derive wind speed and direction. Um, as opposed to SAR, which can derive speed, but not direction. It has, the SAR direction is modeled. 
and ice type. So you can then overlay the wind speed direction on the ice type and see uh, which way the ice is likely to move. But also, we can, with that data, derive pretty precise, precisely the dates of freeze up and break up on a lake. And this is an example from Great Bear Lake. And you can see starting at, at the left, the area of uh, open water, and then the date of freeze up, the freeze up period, the start of break up, break up period, back to open water, back to freeze up date, area, the time, uh, period of uh, ice cover and the date of break up and so forth. So um, that's another, I think, useful, uh, useful tool uh, that's hard, hard to uh, derive. Okay, um, uh, talking about, uh, I talked a little bit about ice thickness um, and those measurements that we use are from years of measurements over the lakes uh, that we dro derive those ranges of ice thickness for those different ice types. This is uh, not what I want to, <laughs> um, so, uh, the Canadian uh, Coast Guard asked me to to uh, help um, uh, test a ground penetrating radar for real time ice thickness measurement uh, uh, measurements of ice thickness along a transect. So there we are in in Midland, and the um, GPR mounted uh, on a Canadian Coast Guard helicopter. And that, yeah, that's me. Uh, <laughs> In the image, and we and then we we drilled holes in the ice in, along a transect every hundred feet out into the bay, and then you can see the helicopter flying the transect and deriving then from the data a map of uh, ice thickness along that transect. So uh, it was one of the projects that you know they help I help with, and uh, um, and and I think it works out you know well for this, you know, it's not just a spot measurement, it's a long transect, so. But concurrently, you know, I had a, when I was at Glural, I had a winter field season and a summer field season. Um, I was working on uh, Lake Color and Coast Watch wanted to produce maps of chlorophyll for the coastal ocean and Great Lakes. And they funded me to have a look at that in the Great Lakes. So I bought a Satlantic radiometer, profiling a radiometer, made measurements, mostly in Lake Michigan because our field station was there, is there, and uh, Lake Erie and some in uh, Lake Superior. And one of the outputs from the radiometer is remote sensing reflectance. Uh, and that is an input to the uh, NASA ocean uh, color uh, ocean uh, ratioing algorithms, open ocean ratioing algorithms. So I put the, and, and of course with the measurements, I, I took water samples, so I knew uh, at that measurement what the chlorophyll was. So I plugged these into um, the OC algorithms, OC1, 2, 3, and 4, and found that they did not work well in the Great Lakes in time or space. Um, and so, I was looking for another algorithm and I happened to hear a presentation by Dmitry Poznikov, who was working with Bob Shukman at Mitri, M M uh, Michigan Tech Research Institute. And he described an algorithm uh, that sounded interesting and productive because one thing, it can drive all four, all three colorants, major colorants, chlorophyll, CDOM, and suspended mineral. So I had measurements, they had the algorithm, so we teamed up. And uh, over the next few years, I made a lot more measurements with uh, the um, Upstate Freshwater Institute folks and, uh, you know, on all the Great Lakes at all times of the season. Most of them were off the um, Lake Guardian, the EPA vessel, uh, nice sturdy vessel. And um, so, you know, and well, let's see, let me go back. 
So they not only had the Satlantic, they had the ACS and the BB-9 for scattering and absorption. And of course, we took water samples concurrently. And I thought Mike, Mike Sayers was supposed to give a presentation on this. So I thought he would explain it much in much more detail. But um, uh, basically, these, this is an example for Lake Michigan. These are some of the products that the algorithm, which we call a, a CPA, color producing agent algorithm, uh, uh, can produce in addition to chlorophyll, CDOM, uh, suspended mineral, we can derive uh, DOC and some other, uh, um, some other uh, uh, information from that data. So, um, well, I, as I say, I thought he would uh, fill in the blanks on, on that, uh, on the algorithm. Um, okay, uh, I'm gonna skip this uh, upwelling. We developed an algorithm to detect and map upwellings. Um, but, and of course, uh, what remote sensing presentation, uh, you know, would, would do it without, uh, without uh, mention of drones. Yeah, um, the Coast Guard uh, headquarters in Washington called me and said, can you deliver real-time ice data to the captains in the pilot house of, uh, in their ice-breaking mission? And I said, well, eh, uh, yeah, but it's not, you know, it won't be satellite, so it, you know, it'll be, uh, it'll have to be by drone. And luckily, some of the folks at, um, at uh, Bob Shipman's group at uh, Michigan Tech uh, Research Institute uh, had experience with drones uh, in some other projects that they had worked on. So I got together with them, got them on the Mackinac, and uh, you can see in the upper left, uh, one of the drones that we used, uh, very, actually off the shelf and expensive uh, drone. And uh, then you can see it in the air, uh, they're being flown. And in the uh, lower right, there we are in the ice. And you would fly it half a mile, mile out. And I say, this was an inexpensive drone. And it could send you know, data real time back to the captain, as you can see in the in the uh, lower left, uh, back to the captain, the pilot house. So, um, so much of this data uh, in in product, or I should say, products, uh, were made available on the Coast Watch uh, website, and this is an example uh, of the home page, uh, actually from 1999 to. Uh, 2023, so about 25 years. And as new data came along, we just added it to the categories that you see there in the proper place. So we had not only the surface temperature data, you know, we had, uh, um, you know, we had uh, the chlorophyll data and the ice data, which as I say now are, I, uh, you know, deliver those algorithms to NOAA and NESTA, so they're running them operationally. And, uh, and we're bringing them down on the website. And I also added the thread server and the ERDAP server um, to facilitate data access and, and data analysis. So as they just, uh, just changed last year, actually, the uh, look of the homepage, but uh, the, the, as I say, the data, and it's still being being downloaded to the, Coast Watch website. So the uh, date, the um, algorithms and data and, and algorithms that I described um, are um, published in a uh, special issue of the Journal of Great Lakes Research on remote sensing of the Great Lakes and other inland waters, edited by Bob uh, Schickman, myself. And although it's dated now the basic algorithms and the data are still valid and can be used as a basis for future um, um, research. So uh, that's it.
And uh, no, that's not AI. 